and what I thought I would first do is a little bit of a demonstration mainly because that's a little bit easier uh, to talk about something which you've seen first rather than talk abstractly and then show you what we're talking about at least that was my idea what I have here is what we call the dialogue editor which is part of the VCC 3.5 package it allows you to easily create various types of windows, PM windows. What I've got on the screen at the moment is the standard list window and this is going to always be fun. What you can see is here, I'll cancel this first, you can yeah you can size this not very easily now on the wall but you can see you can make a particular type, and this is a list box, any size and any position where you will want to have it eventually. What you also have, if I can nicely go up the wall, you can say what style this list box has. And what you see is there are a number of styles. Among one is owner draw, which we discussed yesterday. I'm sorry that it's so small, but um, no adjust position or horizontal scroll bar I can add multiple selection and extended selection now you see now I've just added the horizontal scroll bar what this allows you to do is very simply take a particular window and see if it fits what you need to do with it if I go again, you can go into the test mode and then effectively this window is now working as if it really was uh, a real window and you can react as a user to it. So for example, I can select a line. So you see now exactly how this type of object, this list box, works. Oh. There should be an easier way to do this, but because I can't see what I'm doing there, I have to do it here. But you can take other items and create them. Now this is a container, it doesn't look much. And even when I go into test mode, it's only a white screen because a container needs a lot more information. So I can only, uh, with the dial editor, just put it in the screen where I want it and size it. But we can take, this is a combination box, if I can get it. <laughs> Come on. Yes. And here you see the combination box is effectively the, under, the lower part is a list box and the top part is an entry field. It's a combination. And like anything else, I can then have a look at the styles and see what's available. And you see the combo box has three types of styles, the simple, a drop-down, or drop-down with list. So again, you can play around with certain objects and say, is this the object I want to use? In this way, it is very simple to test a couple of your theories out when you're going to program something. I will go out. There are, of course, simple things like text. And, of course, the text is written up here, and you see it there. Um, you have a couple of other things like... You can change the foreground color, the background color, the highlight color, and so on. So all these things you can do and see if it is going to do approximately what you want to do. That's going to be fun. <laughs> okay, so 
you in fact, go, oh yeah, I have to cancel this, sorry. Uh, these are all the types of windows you can have, checkboxes, containers, entry fields, and so on and so forth. So with the dialog editor, it's very easy to make up a window with all the things you want in it, at the positions you want in it, and use that in your program. That is one way of doing it. Now I will go out. Um, if I save this, then I can use the data again. Okay, now I need to go to Open Office. Oh, nice. No, I don't want recovery. Ah, yes. This is really not easy like this. I think this is the one I want. Okay, slideshow. Yes, okay. So you've now got a little bit of idea of some of the windows you have which you could use with PM programming. Now, the first thing, of course, is to try and understand what is PM programming and what is the differences between your normal way of thinking. The normal way of thinking is, of course, <coughs> that a program has a start and finish. Uh, but a PM program is slightly different. It does have a start and finish, but it doesn't have the classical order of start and finish. So normally you have in a program which you do some initialization, you take some user input, you <laughs> validate the user input, you display it, you clean up and finish. Simple program. But if we have a PM program, you have to consider it as little blocks of program that may execute in any order. <coughs> it will start and end where you know, but in between, all the other things can happen at an unknown moment and in an unknown order. This is what makes PM programming a little bit difficult. As I said, the only thing that's certain is where it starts and where it ends. Let's have a look at the concepts behind PM programming. There are basically three. The first one is messaging. The second one are the windows themselves. And the third part is, is the presentation spaces. Okay. Messaging, I'll come on to a little bit later. A window, what is that? It is a space on the screen. It doesn't have to be rectangular. You can make various shapes. If you think of anything like a, a bubble, pop-up message, you know that is not always rectangular. <coughs> but it is still a window object. And an object always reacts with you as the user. The presentation space is just basically the area where you're going to display something. So before you can display something, you need to get a presentation space. That's the idea behind it. As I said. OK. In a PM program, we have a number of items which are handled interactively. Interactively, sorry. The mouse, the keyboard, the timer, and the windows. They all react with each other and with the user. And the reaction is done via messages. So, messages may be asking for information from something. 
they may be giving information and they may be telling the device to do something. For example, you may be telling the window Thank you. So you may be telling the device to do something. For example, you may tell the window to resize, to move, to disappear. And there'll be some messages which you just don't really fit into any of those specific categories. Messages are placed in a queue to be processed. Sounds easy enough. Each PM program has at least one message queue. The position of the message in the queue, however, is determined by the type of message and when it occurred. So it's not really a sequential queue. Sometimes messages may jump the queue. This makes it a little bit difficult to know what's going to happen. And I said, the queue is not sequential. You can either send messages or you can post messages. There's a difference. If you send a message, then that message is executed and then control returns back to the calling program. So you know something is done. If you post a message, however, the message will be handled asynchronously. So you don't know if and when it is handled. This is the best bit. <laughs> there are over 350 different types of messages. It, it's unbelievable, but it gets a little bit easier. Each message contains the following information. The window handle. In other words, what window am I talking about? It's just a way of defining that window. Then you get the message type referring to that window. You get two parameters, and these are, of course, different for each different message. You also get the time that the message occurred. So we know exactly what happened when. And we know where the, mo <laughs> the mouse pointer was when it occurred. So that's handy. A subset of each message is sent to a procedure. And the procedure should handle that message. There is only one thing, it does not include the time and the mouse pointer. You can also, if you don't think 350 messages are enough, define your own. And often as not, you will do that. Just because you need to do something specific and that is the easy way to do it. If we have a look at the messages, if we have a look at the mouse, this is really nice, mouse move. You get a message when the mouse moves. Almost. Now, of course, it has to move. You get a message when the button goes down. You get a message when the button is released, it comes up. You get a, bus a message when the button is clicked. You get a message when the button is double clicked. So, you even get a message and you, this message in fact is what you normally get when you have moved something and you drop it on another object. Mouse end message. It's telling you that now the object has been dropped. You can even react, remap mouse buttons. So what you can say is button one is now button two or button three is button two because we have three buttons.
in OS2. One, two, and three. So you see for a mouse, it's relatively simple. You just get the messages about the mouse. Of course, what you do with them is up to you. You can ignore them if you want. But generally, you want to react to something that the user is trying to do. We have a timer message. Now, a timer is a very simple thing. All it does, it just gives you the message after a number of milliseconds. And you can program that yourself. You can program it to start and stop the timer. One of the things that you would use that, for example, is you put a message on the screen, you start the timer, and you say, after 10 seconds, remove the message. Because you don't want it to stay there forever. There's only one thing you need to know. Timers are a resource from the system, and the number of timers you can have is limited. Don't ask me how many, because I don't know. But it's like many things, if you have a lot of this and a lot of that, you can't have many of this. Keyboard. Keyboard sounds simple. There's only one message, WM character. So whenever a key is pressed, you will get this message. You also get this message when the key is released. So you get multiple messages. You can also interrogate the keyboard because sometimes it's necessary to know when a key is depressed, has somebody also got the control key down or the alt key down or what have you, the sort of dead keys. Now, messages. For a window there are many, many messages. Uh, most of them are window specific. So, for example, the list box we saw yesterday, LM insert item. So with this message, you are putting something into a list box. Or you have a container, for example, and you get CN enter. Somebody has pressed the enter key while in a container. Other messages you will get will refer to the size being changed, focus being given to that window or lost, and so on and so forth. And this is where 99% of all the messages are related to the various types of windows. Some are universal, like, as I said, positioning a window, or it doesn't matter which window type you have, if you reposition it, we get the same message. But we don't get the same message when you press the Enter key in a different type of window. The biggest problem I feel with PM programming is to know which message I need to look at. OK. In order to use messages, we said we had a queue, but we have to create it. And we have to have procedures to handle them. This is the most important message. You don't have to handle every message. Thank God. You, <laughs> a lot is done by the presentation manager itself. We said yesterday, for example, with owner draw, if you didn't return with the value of one, the PM did it. So you don't have to do everything. But sometimes you want to do something specific. Interestingly enough, a PM program does not only have, have to have one message queue, you can have multiples. And we'll come on to why in a minute. The easy thing with a PM program, when you get the message WN quit, which for example would happen when you press the top window, the close button, that generates a WM quit message, that will cause the program to stop. It will destroy the queue and finish. So, this is what we normally have. We have here the create message queue, then we create a window, 
Then we go to our message loop. We handle the various messages. And at a certain moment in time, we get the quit message, and we're finished. But here we haven't really done much, have we? We need to look at all these messages coming from these devices and do something with them. What do we do? Basically, when a message comes in, we said that message for that window goes to that procedure, and that procedure will handle those messages. For example, here, when we create a window, we get the message WM create, simple enough, and we say, OK, I process that message. What am I going to do? Maybe I'm going to just make the position of the window at a certain place, or I'm going to make it visible, which would be the right moment to do it. Then I'm waiting for other messages, say, such as a character message, because the user is going to press the keyboard for something. So I process all of these. And when you've processed the message, you come to the end of the procedure, and it waits for the next message to come in. Now, often as not, you have more procedures for different windows. You don't have to, but it's sometimes easier to do it that way. The message queue, how do you create it? Simply enough, and now everything's got shifted, I see. You define a handle to the queue. You define an anchor handle and a queued message. Just these variables you need to have. And then simply enough, you say initialize, which gives you your anchor handle, create the message queue, and you've done 90% of the work. The next bit is just to look at each message and pass it on. So you get a get message, it's getting it from the queue, and you're dispatching the message to whichever procedure. At the end, it will fall through when the WM quit message comes, and you destroy the message queue, destroy the anchor block, and you're finished. That's the main part of the pro. This is the bit where you know where it starts and where it ends. The difficult bit is what's happening in between. These messages, where are they going, what are they doing? As I said, messages are handled in procedures. The procedure defines which message, if any, should be handled. Once it's done that, it returns to the calling program. You define a procedure as follows, and what you see is when the procedure is started, it will get the window handle, the message type, and the parameters. The other two items are not given directly to the procedure. Here's, for example, a procedure. So at the top, we take the message type, and by using a switch system, we can take the various types of messages and do whatever for those messages. These two you will use often as not. The create message, because when a window is created, you need to do something with the, that window, position it, size it make it visible, and paint. We saw yesterday in owner draw, whenever you got a message to write something to that window, you had to react on it. The paint message is the same. I will show you at the end with a bit of luck. I, <laughs> I will open a window, and you've probably seen this sometime. You move the window around, but you're not seeing what you should see in the window, you're seeing the background being moved. Ever seen that? That's because the WM paint message has not been done with anything. I have to tell the window to fill itself up. If I don't, it just keeps what's there. And at the end, this is the careful bit. If this was a window procedure, you have to end with win 
define window procedure and if it was a dialog procedure you have to end it with the default dialog procedure. This is very important because if whoops <laughs> otherwise that happens. If you don't and you get the two mixed up and this will happen often as not I've done it hundreds of times myself you put the wrong return you will find that if you do that with a dialog procedure while it's a window procedure you get an access violation you think god what's happened with my program it gives you another message bad stack you think well, why didn't I define my stack properly and you get a software exception so you're really pulling your hair out and all you've done is just use the wrong return procedure the same thing happens if you do it the other way around but it's not so uh, dramatic you just get strange windows messages okay after entering a procedure to handle a message no other messages can be handled which means effectively the system is dead right or not no you have to handle a message within a tenth of a second because if you don't it looks to the user as if indeed the system is dead or very unresponsive I think you all know what happens when you start up a CD it looks as if nothing is happening you can't do anything because that is being handled in the message procedure and it isn't finished until the disk is up to speed so you can't do anything this is what we call the single message queue problem you probably read about it left and right so how do we get around this there are simple ways you move a time consuming process to a separate thread OS2 can have a lot of threads so use them move the difficult stuff time consuming stuff to another thread and then the user can still work with the machine so for example if you were starting up a CD drive move that into another thread and the user can still change his options or settings or what have you and then when the CD comes up it says I'm ready so how do we do it we just call a thread and the other thread we're looking for example if the CD is ready when it's ready we need to inform yourself that it's ready so you send or you post a message UM done and that is a user message saying I'm ready so in that way you got rid of the problem there are many situations when you have to or should move a time consuming item to a separate thread you all know what happens for example if you have a LAN and you log on to another system but the other system isn't there the system hangs again because it's waiting so move it to a separate thread everything can continue and if for example you don't get a reply within a certain amount of time and you can use that by starting a timer then say there's something wrong with your network and you can continue the system isn't dead whoops okay when a window is created it has a parent this is the parent child relationship within windows the child window is always displayed within the parent what you generally see in a program you have a window you can only have windows within the window there are of course exceptions to every rule but that's the way it works it also has an owner who owns me it is the owner of the window that gets the messages this sounds a little bit strange but we'll try and make it a little bit easier in a minute the first window is basically a desktop that's the parent of all windows with the exception of object windows which I will not discuss 
but the desktop doesn't have a parent itself. It is, uh, what should we call him, uh, the grandfather? <laughs> <laughs> Root, yes. When we create a window, we often use what we call create standard window. And the frame, the outside of the window, that is both the parent and the owner of the window. We have these types of windows which I showed you a few in the beginning. These are all types of windows you can create very simply. You say create a button, create a list box, create some text. Oh, that was the demo we did at the beginning. <laughs> Creating a window. Basically, there are two ways to create a window. Use create standard window or create window, and then say what type of window you want to create. Or we use the dialog editor, as I showed you. And the dialog editor is very simple. And you can then see exactly what you get. Using create window, you have to do a lot more work yourself. You have to tell the positioning of the window. So you, it's a little more complex. The dialog editor, you saw, it is very easy and you see exactly what you get. It can create all types of windows except one, the standard window. That's the window you normally see. One disadvantage is that it is limited to 64K. You do this with a dialog editor, it makes a resource file and that resource file is limited in size which is unfortunate because if you start to put in bitmaps, they generally start to exceed 64K very simply. It also, the dialog editor does not really display a bitmap. It just gives you an icon showing that's where it will be, but it, it's not so nice. Let's have a look at the standard window. It consists of many windows, it's just not one. It consists of the title bar, the system menu, the menu, min and max buttons, frame, vertical scroll bar, horizontal scroll bar. But not all items have to be displayed or are displayed. Come on. Yes. Here you see the standard window. So here you see your title bar, you see the frame, you see the system menu. Often as not, this button is replaced by the icon, which is the icon of the program, so you recognize the program. The min-max buttons, and that also includes, of course, the closing button, the menu, so if you have menu, you see, for example, various menu items, a vertical scroll bar, and horizontal scroll bar. Now, when you create a standard window, window you know the identifier, or sorry, the handle to the window. And by using a system of asking for a sub-identifier, which is system menu or what have you, you can also find information about the other windows. And of course here's your client window inside. The way you make it is very simple. You say create standard window and you give it some flags. And these flags just basically say put the min max buttons in, put in an icon and so on and so forth. So whatever items you select as parameters for the command, you can get the window type you want. There are a couple of things to think about when you do this. Is some of the things like icon, like menu, are in the resource file. 
If you don't have a resource file and you specify those flags, it doesn't create the window and you don't get a message. So you wonder, why doesn't it work? That's what I said. Or an accelerator table. The accelerator table is if you press, for example, Alt-A, you know, then something happens, or if you use um, Control-S, normally to save, you have to define what the accelerators are and what they do. But if you forget to do that, it also does not create the window. When a window is created, you either get WM in it, initialize, but that is if you do that via the dialogue editor or a dialogue. And create is if you've used win create window. So you have two different messages basically for the same thing. At the moment, that window has no size. So you're gonna have one of the first things you're gonna do in win create window is to size it. Um, also, the window cannot be focused, or you cannot set the focus to that window. Or normally, if you start a program, you want that window to receive the focus. You want to be able to do something with it. Unfortunately, during the WM create message or the init message, you cannot send a focus message. So you have to wait until you've handled the create or init. You then post a message to say, do the focusing. Um, some things about uh, the message WM character. This is coming whenever the key is depressed. But if you have a list box or you have something else, you do not get those messages. This is, a, this is one of the big problems. Um, you're writing a program, you're going to use a list box, you think, fantastic. Now, supposing the operator presses that particular key, I want to do something. But you don't get the WM character message. So you never know the operator wanted to do something. The way around this is what we call subclassing. And then you can get most of the messages. Not all. One of the notable exceptions is, for example, the mouse button. Uh, in most procedures, you can't get the mouse button going down. You can only get it coming back up. Because the internal procedure for that window has used that message and doesn't pass it on to you. OK, it's more or less what I said. Um, this is uh, one of the advantages, disadvantages of using the dialog box and uh, the dialog editor. All the sizes of those windows are in dialog units. Now, the first thing everybody has asked is, what is a dialog unit? It's simple. It's sort of like a pixel, but if you have a high resolution screen, the, dia the idea is that the dialogue could fit it. And if you have a low resolution screen, the dialogue will fit that as well. So the system calculates the size of a dialogue unit and translates that into pixels. The idea behind it being, doesn't matter which resolution you have, what type of screen you have, you can get the object the same size in relationship to the window size on any computer. So to make the dialogue device independent. Sounds a great feature, right? It works sometimes. <laughs> Here is an example, and let me try and show you. This, these are the various resolutions. Now what you see here is all of a sudden the width of this box is different and you see then I have here more space. So it almost works. Here I have objects 
and you see here, all of a sudden they're pushed together. So, using dialogue units, it works, but you have to realize there are limitations. Uh, one solution to get around this, of course, is you build everything using standard windows. So you look first at the size of the screen, then you say, OK, I need a window half that size, so for example, that's 512 pixels wide, and then I place It's a big hassle. The other way is, of course, just leave plenty of room when you're designing your dialogues. It's the same problem with text. Text works perfectly in one language, and the next language it's far too long. Yeah, and sometimes not. It's, it's sometimes yeah. the other way around, but it's... And of course, then you try and find words that fit, but anyway. So using dialog boxes is very easy, handy for the programmer, but it has its limitations. So be aware. Uh, containers, uh, I mentioned this yesterday, that they can have an enormous amount of records. Uh, 2 to the power of 16 records. But if you have around about 200,000 records in a container, the system may hang. It's just one of those things. Um, yeah? But that's bigger than 2 to the 16. No. Yes. 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 Oh, it should be then 2 to the power of 32 then. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have everything, guys. You were just checking, just checking yeah. you. You're awake, okay. I was just looking at the date here as well. <laughs> Nobody spotted that yet, did I, they? I did. Oh, no, we did. We did. We did. Uh, we just thought that you had an old, old uh, show here. <laughs> well, it says. Yes, there you go. See, there it's okay, but here, yeah. Pictures were turned around. Yeah. The first one, two. Yeah. Pictures were. I should also tell you, if you're debugging and you're using the VCC 3.5, and if you ever set a breakpoint in the paint routine, because you want to see exactly what I'm doing, that I'm putting my text nicely here, then there, I'm putting my color in my back. You're doing all that sort of stuff, but you, something goes wrong, so you go step for step through it. You have to make sure you finish that routine and exit, because if you exit halfway down, the paint routine, you can no longer resize a window afterwards. And the number of times, because the paint routine generally asks you a lot of things to do, I've done this and then, oh shit, I can't get to my other windows because I can't resize, so I have to reboot. But it's not your fault, it's the machine. Okay? I hope I've given you a little bit of insight into PM programming. Of course, in this short amount of time, that's impossible to do a lot. I hope I've made you interested in trying to do some PM programming because it's great fun, honestly. Try it, make a front end for one of your favorite simple programs. So instead of having to remember all the switches, you just make a nice front end where you have a menu and you can select it. And that fills in the switches that you would otherwise know or use. So here are some books. Um, this is even available online. Or you can get the, sorry, the uh, code disk is available online. And the book you can probably order via Amazon or somebody. Art of OS2 programming. They cover approximately the same things, but do it in a different way. And sometimes it's easier to read something which has a different view on doing something. Oops. Hang on, going up. Uh, Another very good book I found is Program Manager Hints and Tips. And online, you can look at this book, Warp Speed. Is it still online? Uh, oh, well, 
It was, yeah. But that's the problem with internet. What's here today is gone tomorrow. What, what about the Wayback When machine? Does that store files or does it only store web pages? Sorry? Did you say that archive? With, might it have that? Oh, I, d I don't know. Files it depends. Sometimes. Yeah, if, if you want to have these files back, you can always go to the Internet Archive or it's, I think it's called the Wayback Machine. The way yep. back and you can and give a day in the past <clears throat> and good luck. Yeah, so that's questions, gentlemen. Ladies, lady, yes? Uh, you haven't said anything about the multiprocessing. Uh, what's the difference? Um, the fact that uh, multiple threats can happen simultaneously. Yes. And can overtake yourself. Yes. Um, what I, I said very briefly was move other things to other threads, and that is effectively multi yeah, multitasking. Uh, effectively what I haven't told you, uh, there is something called, um, what's the proper word now, um, locks and uh, semaphores. So basically what you do is, for example, if I post a message to something that's going to write it on the screen, the first thing I do is say, don't do anything yet until I know that that information that I've sent to the other process has been copied. In the other process, I first of all make a local copy, for example, of the text I want to put on the screen. When I've got that, then I say, OK, you can go on, so I release the semaphore. And so you have a sort of handshaking, that's what semaphores do. But that is a really nice, complex subject, which I thought I would yep. spare you at this time of the morning. <laughs> Especially when you have two semaphores waiting at each other. Yes, yeah. and you, you, you have more types of semaphores. That's the other problem. Uh, you even have semaphores which can count down. You can have semaphores. Right away, other questions. Here's the microphone. OK. Because other people are listening on the audio stream. Yesterday, we had about 21 people listening from all over the world. So. And they didn't hear the questions. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you know, you have a semaphore which you can say, well, if I don't get a message within 25 milliseconds, continue anyway. Because that is the other thing you get in programs. They hang. Why do they hang? They're waiting for something that never comes. So it, that gets complex. And what you often see is, if you've written the program, it works nicely in the beginning. You go to another machine, all of a sudden it doesn't work because you forgot to use semaphores because this machine is faster. So this has destroyed the information before this process can do anything with it. And you get garbage. I've done it often enough. <laughs> and you're going to build a new installer, right? Yes. Any other questions? You were talking about multiple message queues? Yes, yes. Um, I'm a little bit astonished because when you create a window or something, you cannot explicitly specify what message queue you use. There's an internal relation between the message queue, the first one you yes. create. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I knew we were going to get onto all the shitty stuff. <laughs> Well, you were talking about multiple message or the p possibility to have yes. multiple message queues. Yes. And um, I was a little bit astonished because I cannot, from the from the API that you have, the, the, the routines that you have, I can see you can create a you can create a, a, an anchor block, you can create a message queue, yes. and then you create a window. Yes. But the window creation, there's no obvious relationship between the message queue and the window. There is one obviously because yes. the window has to know yes. uh, where. Uh, the window okay. procedure has to be tied to the message queue. So I understand you, you what tell, you're asking. Yeah, can you tell what, what, yes. what would be the intention of having a secondary message queue or more than one and, yes. and how you would use that second one? OK, I would try to tell you it's, it's complex, but basically you create an object window, which I said in the beginning I won't talk about. But an object window is a special type of window and when you create that, you create its message queue. Okay. And normally, that is done so that it can do a number of things. It can get messages from 
other threads without, without influencing your main thread and main messages queue. So you're doing things separately, asynchronously, that will eventually say, okay, here's some information. Yeah, but the object window is, again, it's just a window and you create... It's a special a type of window. Yeah. That's the whole it's point. It's not visible, but... It's but not visible, but you define a message queue for it. Okay, I, I don't remember. I will, I'll have to show you on the... Okay. Yeah, so if you're interested, yeah. I will try and show you an example on my laptop later. Yeah. But it's not an easy thing to discuss now. Okay. But yeah. that's the way you do it, an object window. Special windows. Any other questions? Sorry, we don't have a micro microphone boom to hang over the audience. <laughs> <laughs> we just repeat the question. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? It seems there are no other questions. I've confounded you completely. <laughs> How many people now will think of trying to do PM programming? Yes. Good. If any of you run into problems, please send me a fax. Sorry, fax. <laughs> I'm showing my age again. Send me a mail. Send me an app. And I will try and help you. I can't guarantee I will. But, you know, two heads looking at one problem is always better than uh, going insane. Yeah, so honestly, if you do anything, please try it. If you get stuck, ask me. We can get stuck together. That sounds bad. <laughs> I will try and rephrase this later. But anyway, um, I really enjoy PM programming. It is sometimes very frustrating trying to do something and then suddenly you find the way to do it and then, you know, Eureka! It works! Yeah? I'm not useless. I've, by the way, just for your information, I've only been using um, Visual Age 3.5, so I don't really... Yeah, it works perfectly. It's got a nice debugger. I like it. And, you know, when you get something you're used to... I moved uh, from an earlier version of uh, Visual Age, and I had the biggest problem <laughs> that they changed the way work frames worked. Now, after a number of very time-consuming hours, I eventually worked out how it, the new system worked. And once you've got something that works, you don't like to move on to something unless you absolutely have to. The only disadvantage with uh, 3.5 is it doesn't really handle 32-bit arithmetic. Not 64. No, 32. It uses 16-bit arithmetic. And for most times, it's not a problem. I mean, if you have a large file, you have the upper 16 bits and the lower 16 bits. So effectively, you can work 32 bits. But if you want to subtract, for example, from that number, a number, you have to either write uh, a 32-bit, 16-bit uh, addition, retract, uh, subtraction routine or you have to go on to a, a better version of the compiler. But for 99%, certainly with uh, PM programming, when are you using 32-bit arithmetic? It's, it's in there itself. I mean, the screen's not that big. Not that well, you're going to 4K screens? Even then, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. It's only 4K. Well, maybe, maybe you should say that, unfortunately, this compiler is basically abandonware. Yeah, so but, you have to get it from somewhere. but you can also, there's also GCC, you, uh, but as I say, I, I haven't used it. That's I've got a question actually that uh, you're hooked into it actually. The question is, visual, I, I understood that in some cases visual age 4.0, for some people I heard, is something that you shouldn't be using according, some say it's buggy, I, I don't have a reference frame for it. But I, also, but I also understand that Open Watcom, which you can actually just download free of charge, yeah. also has a pretty good debugger in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sure. sure. Uh, but it's much better, the visual age. What do you oh, visual age. Okay. Yeah. The visual in my age opinion. Debugger. Which is better? The visual age debugger is much better. Yeah, well, I, I, I like it. Uh, it, is, it is simple to step through. 
You can put breakpoints. You can put a breakpoint on memory that gets changed because you fucked up somewhere. Um, but you know, it's it's just nice. It, it, it works for me. Put it that way. But this is like anything. You've got to define your own environment. Get something that you like to use, and then use it. All I'm telling you is, if you want my help, I will give it. But I only really know VCC. VAC, sorry. I just wanted to state that, there yeah. are, that there's alternatives. Yes, there are. Obviously, if you're happy with what you have, then there's no reason, yeah. reason to change. And the main thing you need to be aware is when you install Visual Age 3.5, it's in the README, by the way. It's on the um, extension disk README. There is the... Um, what do we call it? Um, the the package. I'm trying to think of the name. You get it. Um, package manager. No, 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 no. It extend. It, it it brings up all the latest classes and so on and so forth to the latest level. Um, okay. An upgrade. Yeah, but when you install it, you have to move in your conferences in the lib path a certain code to the end of the line, otherwise the system hangs when it starts up and you just get the blue screen. But it's written all in the, the readme, but you know, who reads readmes? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, gentlemen? IRC, have we got any bids on the internet? No, there's nothing. <laughs> okay, sorry. Your stream is slow, but as I okay. explained, uh, for the people that are not on IRC, the bandwidth here at the youth is limited. Hostel, despite that we're paying for it, it sucks like a vacuum cleaner. It's yeah. nothing. So sorry for that. Next year, better. Okay. <laughs> okay, gentlemen. I hope I've helped you a little bit. And uh, thank you.